Western. Uh, it is wonderful to see all of you here. Uh, it's great to have another Blister Speaker Series. But beyond that, we are also kicking off here at Western the Protect Our Winners Shop Talks Tour at universities. So congrats on being at the launch. And this is Mr. Jeremy Jones's first time here at Western and his second time in the Gunnison Valley. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your first time? Uh, my first time here was um, the very first X Games. Anyone? Was anyone? <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, and I had a, um, so at that point in my life, I kind of made uh, enough, I was fast enough on a snowboard starting at 16 to kind of make enough money to um, get myself around the world racing. And um, I don't know, around a couple of years into it, four years, I always loved to free ride. My brothers lived in Jackson Hole. A couple, couple of years into that, uh, my brother's like, hey, you gotta get to Valdez, uh, sell everything you have, come up here and this place incredible, snowboarded there and started um, pretty quickly getting into some films. Anyways, right before the Crest of Butte thing, um, I had officially like made this scary career transition from getting paid to go fast on a snowboard to free ride. And, but border cross was new to the world and they're like, you'll probably be fast. And I went there and um, I pulled out of the gate behind Sean Palmer on a warm up run and and even prior to that I'm like seeing these racers wax techs I'm like oh I'm back in this thing but anyways I pull out I'm like let's see what this Sean Palmer guy's all about and I get on his tail and he just takes off like I have velcro on my base and um, that confirmed that border cross is not a path for me <laughs> <laughs> he was like it was so scarring he has never been back here till now, so we're glad that- That is not true. I, I'm grateful, I'm sad that I have not been back since then. I'm grateful I am finally back here because I have the utmost respect for the mountains, the people that have come out of here. Um, you guys clearly have a real mountain because some of the best in the world on the mountain and off the mountain are from here. So I do feel like I've uh, spent time here. Hmm. Yeah. We were just talking a bit about your full film, Purple Mountains, which we got to just see a bit of, um, that came out September 2020. And you and I talked shortly after it came out. And uh, I, I had to go back the other day and, and remind myself when that was. And I would be curious hearing you talk a bit about the, the state of, I don't know, the world um, then and the sort of message of that film and what you were hoping to do, how do you think we're doing two years later? Yeah, I mean, kind of excluding the COVID side of things, um, that film is really never shown in a live audience, uh, which looking forward to uh, finally doing that uh, in a couple of days. But um, I would say as a society and as a country, the message of Purple Mountains is, me going out and finding people that love the outdoors, uh, have the same love as myself for it, their life revolves around it, uh, but are politically on the other side of the aisle. And, um, and it's like start, the basis is like find where we connect and we have hard conversations, we have mountain to mountains. And I would say that it's um, where we are today, two years later is unfortunately we're no closer um, as a society. It's still very, you know, divided. Um, and we still struggle at Protect Our Winners, what we, we call the outdoor state, that we feel like if we can unite a decent amount of it, we can be very powerful. Uh, but that's still a, a hard 
thing to do because of different um, political views. Yeah. Say just a bit more about that, the outdoor state. Um, how big of a demographic, when we're talking about people that are super passionate about getting outside or getting out in the mountains, what kind of size of a demographic is that? Yeah, so the outdoor state is people that you know, really identify um, a, a big part of their life is getting outdoors, and to do so requires clean air, clean water, and a healthy planet. Uh, that group of people and the economics tied to that is bigger than the extraction industry, it's bigger than the pharmaceutical industry, uh, but there is not a single lawmaker that is afraid of taking a vote against the outdoor state, which in our opinion is a vote against any policy that is not incentivizing clean air, clean water, and a healthy planet. Um, and so that's really our goal at Protect Our Winners is try to un unify around this central issue um, and ideally make it a, a single issue voter because the reality is nobody has ever lost an election due to their stance on climate change. And you can, I actually said that to Senator Bennett and he's like, well, it, it, Colorado, it's gotten kind of close on that. And, um, but it just, you know, it, it needs to, um, we do need to come together, but the, the good and the bad of the outdoor state is actually politically quite divided. It's roughly 40% Democrat, 30% Republican, 30% independent. So protect our winners. Um, we really focus on just trying to, uh, a, get that, you know, middle, independent, what have you, and then also the non-voter. And the non-voter happens to be uh, generally younger, happens to ski and snowboard a stupid amount of time, and <laughs> forgets to vote. Um, so we're in set up well to get to that non-voter. <laughs> I want to go back to the start of Protect Our Winners, and let's, let's, go back to say a year before it officially launched. Yes. Where was your headspace at the time on that, on that front? I mean, you and Protect Our Winners, I think, have come a long way. I think the messaging is getting clearer and clearer. But where were you in, what, 2006? Yeah, it was actually, it took a while for me to um, get it off the ground. And I think it was something even dating back to like 2004 that I started to realize like I was seeing issues in the mountains that coincided what the scientific community was saying. Um, and then I remember it was like, I want to say in, um, it was in Terrace, BC, and there was a, there's a small local hill and it was, I believe, 2005. And I am, uh, it was middle of the winter, um, I was heliboarding, and it was, um, we were waiting for good weather, and I got to be friends with these locals, and they're like, hey, let's go uh, take a hike up the local hill, and it was all grass, and I was, um, and they're showing me, like, the jumps and the warming hut that's a ghost town, and it's all, you know, decaying and stuff, and, and I'm like, why, what happened? Uh, why isn't it open? And these guys were like, 30s and um, they're like well it just doesn't snow here anymore and I was like wow these guys are not that old to like have these fond memories and that are no longer there because of snow uh, and that just kind of started happening and then it was uh, really overwhelming and by myself I have this idea and then I just started um, like figuring out what steps needed to take and it took me two years, because I'd move the ball forward, and then I'd go and snowboard a while, move the ball forward again. And, and from the get-go, I was like, the only way this is gonna work is if people come and rally around it. And so I found a lawyer to help with the, the nonprofit application, a web designer, so on and so forth. And, and um, that, so we officially, took about two years to bumble through that process, and in 2007, we launched. Okay, so 2004 to, let's say, 2008, that first year after launch. How out there did this either seem to you or to seem to other people that maybe you were telling about this and, hey, I think I want to start this organization? Um, and maybe a related question, 
were you having people tell you like, dude, don't do that? No. So the, the reality is at that point it was before it become such a polarizing issue. So, um, I, and I knew as a professional athlete, I knew the magazines, I knew, uh, the film companies, I uh, knew a bunch of people working at, the, at different companies, and I and from the get-go, I'm like, this cannot be a Jeremy Jones Foundation. This needs to, um, you know, we got to get other people. And so immediately, Transworld Snowboarding, oh, yeah, we got ads for you, Powder, we got ads for you. Um, Absinthe Films, we'll put a spot in front of you. We'll even shoot it for you. And so everyone just kind of came together, and I made a point of, like, early ads. Um, it couldn't, I didn't want it to be me. And so I'd focus on other athletes, but the reality is we knew there was an issue. We didn't know what to do with about the issue. So we just kind of like threw it up there. And the early stuff was about, um, light bulbs and water bottles and things of that nature is how it got started before. And pretty quickly, uh, some like climate experts. And I mean, I'd read an article, I remember reading about Auden Schendler from, uh, Aspen, uh, in time or something, I like found his email. I'm like, hey, I got this thing. You want to help? And like, they kept saying yes. And and it's only because of all these people quickly coming around that we got off and running. So then, in your experience, because this is always an interesting thing, when things really start to say feel to a founder, when did things really start to? gain momentum right these things are very rarely linear right. when did it feel like okay i think we're really seeing a different kind of momentum to this yeah i mean it it was very it was like kind of at the beginning there was nobody getting paid and then a couple of years in we were able to have one full-time person that turned to two so i'd say the first six years or so were you know kind of limping along um but with some forward progress and then for sure around you know there's no question like by 2012 we were really had some experts in the room with us and and knew where we were targeted that really happened in um in 2010 i believe there was a bill and it was first time that we realized like wow if we can pass climate policy we that's where real reduction uh, can be had and and there was this Really, uh, we missed an opportunity in 2010 to pass this um, Marquee Waxman bill, which was a um, was really a carbon tax. And at that time, it uh, it with some extra effort, uh, if Obama leaned into that, there, the, people look back and be like, "Wow, that could have that we really had a real chance to pass meaningful climate legislation." He ended up going towards Obamacare. Um, Citizen United happened right after that, and then now we have this massive flood of money from the fossil fuel industry because their product almost got taxed, and then that's the start of this toxicity that we see today. So you're dating that around 2012 is when you feel like that situation changed? Yeah, yeah. I'd say with the full breadth of it, it was um, started really ramping up to that. and. I'd love to hear you talk a bit about, um, I mean, you've just talked well about the early days of Protect Our Winners, but you can answer this either with respect to your own individual take on this or the organizations. How has the mission either stayed the same or how has it evolved? Um, I mean, I think that it's, we've largely known where we need to win. Um, we know that large scale CO2 reduction is not happening without policy. And we've known that uh, dating back, you know, 2009. And what has changed is, um, you know, getting a clear understanding of we don't need to win everywhere. We need to win in a couple key spots. Um, and that can get, you know, make a huge difference. So we've kind of sharpened our, our arrows, so to speak, and we know what our ta targets are and, and, and um, gotten more acute with our focus. So what does that mean when you say we know where we need to win and we know what the targets are? What, what are we yeah, talking so about? Yeah, so to be clear, 
from day one, Protect Our Winners has um, been a, what we can, we are a bipartisan group focused on climate action. So just, I just want to frame that. Um, and when we go to Washington, D.C., it's 70% of our meetings are with moderate conservatives that we think have, you know, are, are want to take a, a good vote for us. Um, so that, you know, that, that's kind of been with us from the get-go. But the reality is um, the difference between, say, having a, a climate lead, a climate denier leading our country and a climate champion is about 50,000 votes in five key states. Now, Colorado's one of them, which is why I'm sure you're sick of campaign ads. Um, but that's an example where we can't bring all 50,000 of those votes, um, but we can we can bring a couple thousand to each of those states, and and collectively, you know, it's so tight. Like we're really need to win in these key, key places uh, if we want climate champions in office. And I, I also really believe that, um, and, and my dream is that we are an election or two away from debating who's better on climate, the, the Democrat or the Republican on the ballot. And I, but I do think that there needs to be a really strong message that says like, holy shit, I lost that election because I took a, you know, I voted for the fossil fuel industry and, um, and against, you know, a healthy future for, for mankind. That would be a very exciting world to imagine where <laughs> our two major parties are trying to outmaneuver the other for being better on climate. So, so I'm just going to say something here tonight since we're live, because I've thought about this, because my favorite thing is not going to DC and arguing about climate action. I am, I am a total uh, hippie lover of like, I get along with everyone. And I'm like, how do I get out of this corner that I painted myself in? And I think it's, I don't even know if I should say this, I've never said this publicly, but I really think that it's like a kick-ass conservative on climate in the White House. I would be like, then I can go to the beach, so. <laughs> I wanna talk about that actually, as I imagine, and maybe you can correct me if I have this wrong, I just assume that Protect Our Winners has taken up more and more of your time. As you just said, turns out your favorite thing to do on earth is not necessarily putting on a suit and going to DC. How do you feel about that decision? Because man, you, your life could have just stayed on a trajectory that it was on and that would have been a pretty envious life from many of our perspectives. Do you spend much time thinking <laughs> about the road not taken? Well, I would probably have le less people that maybe dislike me. <laughs> um, but no, I really like looking out at all of you. I, it's so awesome to, to be in this room. And, and I get to call myself a professional snowboarder because the community has supported me in films and the products that I make, all this stuff. And so I am, it's this huge, um, I have huge gratitude for this opportunity. And to think um, that I would take this opportunity that the people have bestowed on me. I'm not like swimming in X Games medals and, and checks from contests. Like I am built from all of you supporting in one way or another stuff that I'm a part of. Um, and so to know that there's a problem out there, to know that I have a voice, to look at these kids here and, and be like, I, yeah, I don't want to get in any hard conversations. Like that is, now I can't sleep at night. Um, I actually have learned how to sleep with, you know, attacks. Should we talk about some, some attacks? Uh, this, this is another thing, because we've been talking about this alternative uh, version of your life, right? Where it's just like, man, that guy's real good at snowboarding. And <laughs> stick to snowboarding. Stick to snowboarding. How, I mean, on the one hand, uh, none of us are unaware of uh, 
the difficulties that come, say, with social media. And that is for people who are not um, trying to push hard on a, politi a particular political agenda. You do get a lot of those attacks. And how, how have you come to think about that? Frankly, how have you come to like handle that? Yeah, well, for starters, the, the people that are telling me to stick to snowboarding, I just want to, I know they're concerned about that, but I, I'm really sticking, I do a lot of snowboarding. <laughs> <laughs> like a real lot of snowboarding. <laughs> like I think I, you know, I'm, I, yeah, so, which helps. <laughs> so that's super helpful um, to go out and snowboard every day and so grateful for that. And, um, and I guess as far as the, um, the attacks that I get is, one is like under, empathy, like understanding what created that person. Nine, or 99 out of 100 times, I'm like, oh, white male from a swing state of, you know, middle 30 to 50 years old and usually a private account. And so, and they are on it right away. And then I'm like, well, there was, you know, the amount of money that has been spent on creating that person's belief system from the fossil fuel industry from a very young age is so significant. So I actually have, he happens to listen to a different radio station than me. So I, I've learned to like, I don't have any hatred towards them. And um, so that's really, Understanding of where it's coming from and, and what created it is, um, is where. And then I actually I have real deal empathy for, for that. And for, you know, those people who are worried that you're not on a board enough, <laughs> l let's actually talk about that for a little bit. Um, are you riding as much as ever? How, how do you <laughs> bake that into being a father and being a big part of protect our winners. Um, it, it, your life is not as simple as it used to be. That seems like a given. Yeah. So I have, um, from a young age and sorry, parents in the room. Um, but I starting at about 14, I'm like, I don't care if what's going on behind me, I'm going to the mountain. And that often means the wheels are totally falling off in, in the world we call life. And so it's just consistently worked. Like that is a, such a um, fulfilling place and, and it's as important to me as, as ever before. And so I've just kind of prioritized that from a young age of getting into the mountains uh, consistently. And then the people I work with uh, understand that. I have some of them here that are like, yeah, that I drop a lot of balls, unfortunately. So apologize to those people, but I'm good at, um, you know, I declared e email bankruptcy a long time ago. So if anyone has emailed me, I apologize. Um, but, you know, I'm good at like thinking about what, you know, what are my goals for the year? What am I going to prioritize? And and then okay with letting other stuff fall apart. With kids, it's been really helpful. And my kids, we'd love to recreate together. Uh, my wife as well, so that is an easy thing because that is another thing that I really prioritize. And, and you'll, you know, anyone in my town, you'll see me at the bus stop in my snowboard gear in the morning and in the afternoon and like making a point to be there and so. It's a balance, um, and I guess it's probably more about like what balls need to be kept in the air at that moment in time, and, and it, depending on the season and time of year, it might be different balls that you keep in the air and let also the ones you let drop. Yeah, but you're going to get your mountain time in. I am selfish. I still am yeah, selfishly on the mountain a lot. One fun anecdote from a bit earlier this evening. I we were talking and I said, hey, by the way, tomorrow morning, if you're up for it and you just cut me off and you're like, I'm up for it. I was like, I haven't told you what I was about to propose. It, it, it didn't matter. So uh, I think I think the stuff about uh, getting in the mountains uh, being a priority um, seems quite genuine. Yeah, sometimes it is a quick deal or I have to time a skin to 
a conference call and apologize to my, I don't like to do that, but if it's a difference between getting out and getting and not, then, then so be it. So yeah, just, I think all of us in this room are doing that. I can see it in everyone's faces. You guys are all getting outside. I can see it. So um, I think we all are, you know, playing that balance act. Mm -hmm. So you've talked well about kind of your own wading into the waters, you know, to sort of think, what, what can I be doing to try to help uh, in terms of climate action? I think that there still seems to be a decent amount of misunderstanding or confusion about where Protect Our Winners is today. And maybe the simplest way we can try to clear up some of that confusion is with this question. I'd love to hear you talk a bit about individual behavior versus policy and legislation and voting, right? What, what, is, yeah. what is the Protect Our Winners stance on these things, right? Well, so you're talking about, um, if I ask the question, like what you really wanna ask is like, how do you weigh personal carbon footprint and all these other factors and who's allowed to care about climate action and who's not? Yep. Is that yeah. the question you're trying to ask? Well done, yeah, you're good, we should switch. <laughs> you can go right to it. <laughs> um yeah so it's a great question of like who's qualified to care about climate and and we'll you'll see um you know people like oh you probably drive a tacoma and have a protect our winter sticker on your truck and da 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 and i had i was recently at a stop sign and this like modded out monster truck comes by and i'm in my little electric car and like, oh, this guy probably hates my guts and um, look at, you know, and, and just stereotyping the hell out of this guy is covered in mud and, um, and he drives by and he's got a Protect Our Winners uh, sticker on the back of his modded out monster truck. And I'm like, that is so cool. Um, <laughs> we want that person to be able to say, I like to drive monster trucks and I do want climate action. I want the snowmobile or the, you know, especially in Michigan, that it, the, the snowmobile industry could be huge advocates for getting climate champions in office. So that's really, I think, how Protect Our Winter sees it. How I personally see it is I do live a very examined life um, and try to improve um, really since I started Protect Our Winners and constantly learning and, and evolving on that front. But why we are not these, um, you know, you gotta drive this car, you gotta eat this way, you gotta do that, is we want the doorway to walk in to protect our winners to be really wide. Um, and that's our, that's our goal. Okay, but to stay on that, so somebody else might be seeing someone in the lifted monster truck with the Protect Our Winners sticker and just saying that's hypocritical. And if your organization is cool with that person and their decisions, then I don't know what you're even about. So there's a lot of different groups out there. And, and so you could say there's you know, the far left, there's the far right. And, and I guess to answer that question, the far left for sure is saying exactly that. Well, guess what? We're not trying to, we, we know how those people are gonna vote. We're really hyper-focused on the middle, um, and Purple Mountains is about that, where I am with a hard rock miner snowboarding, what you guys just saw the clip of. I am, we feel like um, we need global action on this, regardless of what car you drive. And we've all been born into a fossil fuel incentivized world, and if you do the numbers on CO2 reduction, Yes, diet is great, car, what car, personal choices are great in there, and I do not want to dissuade them, I, use, I do it all, um, but the large-scale CO2 reduction needs to happen at a policy level. It's something like 80% um, of the, of the uh, or it's like the top 100 companies in the world represent 80% of the CO2 emissions, so we need to, flip that and um, and we need that with voting and that's why 
we are pushing this boat so hard. Mm -hmm. And so, again, because I think a lot of the people that I've talked to um, have sort of said, well, I'm not sure about Protect Our Winners because they don't seem to be demanding enough or asking enough for individuals to, to change their diet, you know, walk everywhere, only ride bicycles, you know, something like that. But what has become clear to me is that I think the organization really is first and foremost focused on the systemic change that is actually going to solve the issue. And so while these other things, I don't hear you being anti individual behavior, behavior or that anti self-examination or that attempt to reduce individual carbon footprint, it's not ultimately going to move the needle. Accept that or uh, tweak what I just said there. So now you've now worn my hat and done a better job than me. So now we're even. No, okay, zero, we're zeroed out. Thank you. So yeah, very, that's totally, you said it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I had the opportunity to um, attend the Protect Our Winners Leadership Summit. Um, it feels like about five months ago now, but I think it was only like three or four weeks ago in Reno, Nevada. And I'm gonna go one more. Like we're, tonight, I guess we're trying to clear up some misperceptions. You've already spoken really well about this, but frankly, I think some people don't believe you when you're like, we want this to be bipartisan, right? And, you know, I was at the leadership summit. To be very honest, I didn't know what I was going to find there. Um, figured there'd be a lot of nice people, and there were. But I attended two talks, both of which were led by Republicans, conservatives, that we're very much trying to make this move to uh, make the, this issue less partisan. There was a wonderful conversation where um, the, the communications director, I think from the American Conservation Coalition, was just talking about like, hi, um, these are the productive ways to talk to people that maybe fall on different ends of the political spectrum and why certain terms and words are just really pretty counterproductive. Um, I thought that was very interesting. I mean, that was his kind of signature uh, talk at the leadership summit. So I guess I don't know, do you have thoughts where, where this is coming from that this like, well, protect our winners is just preaching to the choir or we're just trying to stay in some bubble because hearing you tonight, being at the kind of internal event, it's not what I see happening. So I'd love to clear this up or help people who have this thought um, come to maybe a different consideration. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've been really consistent with our language on that. So I don't know how, why this is going to clear up any more than everything else we yeah. put out about that. The, ACC, we love them, American Conservatives for Climate, or I don't know the exact acronym, but we were so happy when they came along and we've been close with them from the get-go, and they're right, and, and we, dating way back, um, you know, say stewardship, uh, not this, or like, I mean, we made every mistake you could make by uh, just out of language, um, and so, and I do, feel like, uh, you know, the, the Republican Party has a, traditionally has done amazing conservation efforts if you go back in, uh, you know, the history of conservation. And I, and I hope and I think that we will we'll get there and whether or not it's this election or in a couple, I don't know. I did want to ask you about Hillary Nelson. Um, this was a big loss. Um, in the ski community, in the snow sports community, and I just wanted to hear your thoughts about Hillary and what she meant to you. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we all feel this loss coming, you know, being in her home state. Um, I look to the 
the women and the girls in the room, um, like, and as well as the men, because Hillary was a huge hero of mine. She was the best, to, one of the one of the best, taking gender aside, male, female, to ever do this thing of you know walking up mountains and and these expeditions and stuff, um, and coincide. Um, having the opportunity to be in Washington, and I've heard her give speak or, uh, talks in front of our lawmakers about um, the Arctic, and and I've met with them and seen her, you know, her just powerhouse that she is, in, in talking to our representatives. Um, the last day I was with Hillary. It was like the classic rush to get her kids um, out the door to go to school, and then. You know, have a great day in the mountains. So also this really committed mother and rush back home so she's there when they get back from school. And um, and yeah, it's a, it, just to see such a super human um, be taken. And I think it, it's just a, it's really a testament to the mountains, like how real and significant it is and, and why, you know, I don't consider myself an expert. Hillary did not consider herself an expert. She was playing a dangerous game and, and pushing the limits in a really dangerous place. And, and, um, and I guess just the thing, I was just listening to an interview with her um, and what I thought was so astonishing that kind of sums up her, her gusto um, well, she's been on like, I think it was about 40 expeditions. And so these are take, you know, you have to raise money for them. They take a month to two months long. And I mean, you put your whole life into them. You maybe you do uh, generally do maybe one, one, maybe two of these a year. And, and she, they were asking and she's like, yeah, I've um, only, she's like, I maybe had success on half of those expeditions. And I can tell you, um, that mean you know taking huge swings if you're like in my world just to put it and it's not because i'm better than her it's because i was not taking as big a swings as her like i mean i now like it was so rare for me to come back and be like hey so i know you spent a bunch of money but like we failed um and i just thought it was a testament to like how much um like guts and how you know she really swung for the fences and hit a lot of home runs and did stuff that's never been done on a consistent basis. And uh, unfortunately, the, the mountains caught up with her. Questions from some of you. So when you're meeting with the lawmakers in Washington, when you're talking with them, has there ever been one that answered you like, with a really compelling reason for why they wouldn't vote for climate, like one that would make you stop and think for a second? Has that ever happened? Yeah, I mean, they all generally have a similar answer of the it changes from year to year, and then it's like it's passed out, like this is our stance. But, you know, it's like, well, jobs, it's a lot of like language of like, we're just not there quite yet, or um, we don't want it to, you know, hurt the economy, and da 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 da. And so, but this is an example of some tact, or not tactics, but like where we, we go in and it's like, where can we find common ground? So, cause we're not in there fighting. We're like, okay, we know what we're up against. So this past round was based on um, transmission lines and, um, and updating the grid. And our ask was like, we, you know, which are regardless of what we're feeding into the grid right now, and our transmission lines, they need major updating. And so that we're pushing for that right now. And then we want the market to decide uh, what the be you know, best, most affordable form of energy to feed that grid is. So that is, they can, that's just something we can all sit around and agree on. Um, and they might go and say, yeah, totally. And maybe it's more natural gas, maybe whatever. But we know with an updated grid, updated transmission lines, that renewables are gonna, you know, be the ones that are gonna feed that grid. So we have, you know, we had a bunch of meetings where, you know, we saw eye to eye on a lot of things. Throughout my journey here, it's just kind of felt me with this feeling of pessimism about the future. Um, I've talked to many of my classmates who are feeling the same way. Um, how would you combat that emotion um, and be positive about the future um, in, in regards to climate? 
Yeah, so I feel your pessimism um, and my, it's like action over apathy is like, okay, what, what are, and I think of it as like climbing mountains and it's like, okay, like, yeah, we don't have the summit figured out, but there's a step here we can take, a step here we can take, has been my general uh, thought process the last couple of years. But I can tell you, um, I have real optimism right now. Uh, this Inflation Reduction Act that passed, it's not perfect, but it, pow, we like to say progress over perfection. Uh, already it's been about a month and the ripple effects from that already are massive. Um, so the original like Estimate was $367 billion we're going to be spent in the U.S. on um, climate solution infrastructure. And Credit Suisse just came out and said, actually, um, we think the number that's going to be invested in the next 10 years is $1.7 trillion. And this is... Um, new factories in Ohio, North Carolina, Michigan, um, all across the country, thousands of jobs. Uh, and what's exciting is a lot of where these factories are going are in red states. So they actually now think, because there's a concern of like what happens if the pendulum swings, which you know we've seen in this country, um, they actually think that although not a single Republican voted for the Inflation Reduction Act, it's so um, job creative that they it, politically they have to go with it. Um, and the U.S. by you know within the next 10 years, um, you know it, it potentially would be the biggest producer of energy in the world, the biggest battery or not the biggest um, battery producer but uh, cars, and so we have all these uh, companies from all over the world coming into the U.S., and it's, they equate it to the tech boom of, say, the, the 2000s. Um, if you, you kids here, like you, you know, the, the, we don't know necessarily, it won't be a central place like Silicon Valley, but this uh, transition to clean, tech is the new boom that is coming our way and it's coming really fast and it's something that I can now say to all you kids in college like it's a really exciting time to be entering the workforce. So snowboarding like flipboarding or heliboarding can you walk us like through your thought process of one of your, one of your scariest experiences and how you overcame it? So I got to plug my book. There's only one of these out. It just came Art of Shralpinism. That explains my process, which is, um, you know, the mountains are, it's just so much um, going on. And this book is based around the idea of experience is something you get just after you need it. So I'm really experienced, meaning I've had a lot of hard lessons. Thankfully, I'm still in this chair. But my, um, my new favorite saying in the mountains is, if it's not a screaming yes, it's a no. And I guess when it comes to fear, I, I think it's, um, I ask myself over and over again, like, is it boogeyman fear? Which boogeyman fear is, it's the middle of the night, you're walking through a glacier, you're hearing the Seracs fall, which the Seracs, fall all the time there's a re you know we're nowhere near them and you're getting ready to cross a Berkshire run and start cramponing up these steep faces and everything in your body is telling you turn around turn around turn around this is not safe you see a little snow come down and um, and then we'll turn around and get back to camp just as the sun's coming up and we'll look at our track and we'll be like we're exactly where we were supposed to be and we were just afraid of the dark. And <laughs> we're all afraid of the dark. Um, so that's, so you have to, you know, there, there's the real fear, fear or boogeyman fear, and it's this intimate conversation with that. And then, um, and I think so many of the decisions are made 
before you get into the mountains. Um, mistakes that I've made have been where I get too caught up, too far forward. Uh, when I, I look at these complex lines, is it's like you have to turn 20 no's into 20 yeses. So when you do get to the top, you're like, I cannot believe the 20 things just lined up. So we are now at the top and we get to ride. Now standing on the top of a line when you can't see anything and you know it's a no fall zones and all that, um, then yeah, it's a lot of breath work at that point. I've, a lot of my riding partners, I've seen them throw up on the top of these lines. Uh, and then it's just simplifying being super present and, um, and trying to be really open and in the moment to be able to, to hear and feel the signs that the mountains are giving you. What are like, what's like your procedure to identify and tackle some of the issues that you're involved with? Yeah, so our approach is, we, from the start, I've tried to surround myself with the smartest people on climate and, um, get them in the room and, and hash out, like, where are we going to point our arrows? And, um, and I guess that, you know, and then that, from that, we will build out, like, this is who we are. This is how we communicate. Uh, this is where we put our uh, focus. So that we have, like, really clear procedural protocols in place. So when something comes across, it's like, well, is that, are we diverting from our mission and, and like having clear mission, um, uh, clear OKRs, um, objective known results, uh, and just laying out those goals and then gut checking ourselves when, you know, an issue pops up or, or what have you. What are your thoughts on kind of Citizens United, the amount of money that goes into the opposition to climate action? industries that benefit from protecting our winners, have you seen the same kind of financial weight thrown behind climate action from, say, the outdoor industry? Yeah, so, yeah, the, the sense Citizen United, the amount of um, fossil fuel uh, money that is spent on our elected officials is just astronomical. Um, but as we said, you know, the outdoor industry is actually uh, in the U.S. provides more jobs um, and is a bigger industry than the um, extraction industry. Unfortunately, the outdoor, what we call the outdoor state or the outdoor industry, is horrible at unifying around climate action. Um, my, an example would be where I live, uh, bar none, the biggest uh, economic driver is the eight resorts in, in my congressional district. Our congressman is considered one of the three worst congressmen on Capitol Hill. He's taken like 350 anti-anything climate votes. So yet when we go to ski areas and say, hey, like, this guy's voting against the long-term well-being of your industry. When we go to companies and say, or at the outdoor trade show when we used to have those, and I'd see every booth, which I love, is, you know, recycled this and sustainable this and da-da-da-da. And then we go around and ask, like, hey, can you sign on to this letter? Only a fraction of them do um, and that you know so it, that's been one of the more frustrating things that protect our winners is is trying to get full buy-in and it goes back to the outdoor state is is divided uh, politically and and that's just you know kind of the challenge that we're at and and I think um, you know again hopefully we can unify and and in a perfect world turn the outdoor state into a single issue voter for an election or two. We should get this. I actually have a two-part question. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do you need a no for it? First, going back to the clean tech industry that you said is kind of getting built, what are they specifically doing? And two, how do you feel about carbon neutral? Like that tagline kind of seems a little marketing to me, um, since they're just like paying to not have I mean, I understand that can work, but yeah. 
So we're talking like every facet of what um, needs to be built from a clean tech industry. So that could be, you know, one of the things I was reading about was actually like a battery recycling uh, plant to cars, to solar panels, to windmills, to um, every little facet of, of what gets made. And that's the beauty of this bill is um, it, it incentivizes um, to do the right thing opposed to penalizing doing the wrong thing. And so the, the industry actually loves this bill because if you go for what we call the carrots in the bill, you will be highly incentivized. And there's never been a, um, and you can go back from like wood to coal to oil to fracking, every single transition, energy transition in America has been led with policy change. Um, and so we finally have that uh, here today. And then the carbon neutral thing, um, I think it's, you know, I'm sure there potentially is people doing it right, but by and large, that to me is a red flag. Um, I could spend a couple thousand dollars and get to put that on every one of my snowboards and, and you know, throw handfuls of seeds out the window and plant 10 trees for, per snowboard. And I just, um, yeah, that, that's a, something that we had, you know, when we would talk about, we were like, God, such and such companies, carbon neutral, they're planting a tree aboard. And that looks so rad. I was just in the shop and we want that hang tag. And, and we're like, we stayed away from it. And we do, we grow, we have a rainforest in um, Costa Rica that we've been supporting and it's 80 different trees, $25 a tree, 98% success ratio. And we do that uh, because it's turning uh, scorched farmland into back into rainforest and it's the only person that we know that's doing that and now you know UNICEF and these different things are starting to study this model that we can hopefully bring to Africa and these other uh, torched you know ranch lands Thank you. Upper, upper deck my question is how do you shift the messaging that is sent out to major Republican and conservative and middle ground players, because there's a game plan for Democrats and Republicans, how do you change it so that they can still get that funding from the Republican Party while sending a different message? How do you think that happens over time? Yeah, I mean, I think it, like we all start out as like when you make these changes, you probably start out as a hypocrite for a little bit and you, and you get like give a little bit of a grace period. And um, but I yeah, it will be interesting um, from a funding perspective if we do see that type of change because they are, I mean, it is such an exciting, energetic uh, place to be. And there's other, like the, as you double the output of something, the cost significantly goes down and you have this, um, this kind of feedback loop. And so it's just a really exciting place. And now on the flip side, you have, we're now to, to continue to say, dig up um, fossil fuels. We're in the harder to reach places that cost a lot more. So you have this one thing where the cost is going up, the other one where the cost is going down and there's a point where, um, and then the, the amount of jobs being created in this space. And that was where we always had optimism because even in our darkest hours, we're like, we have the solutions, they create a ton of jobs. And now they're incentivized. So um, I think that the market's going to you know, hopefully um, naturally shake out some of these issues. I think that's a really smart thing to say. And you've already talked about the market forces shifting and changing and what is becoming profitable and where investors are putting money. And there will be, I really like that, notion where there's going to be a period of hypocrisy while these things transition, but pretty soon um, that person who used to be getting all their funding from certain places, it's like, this is where the market is headed. This is where job creation is headed. This is where if we want to keep this country as a 
at the forefront of technology, we have to make these moves or we're frankly being unpatriotic. Yeah. That's pretty good. We are coming to DC with us. He's back. <laughs> good. Uh, let's just do, I'm afraid we're going to need to just do two more questions. Um, and uh, so you pick, so I, they, they're okay, mad at we're you. We're going to go back left. We haven't been back left. How was POW and your journey with POW mm -hmm. affecting you? Because I detected some real conflict in your piece there. And I was wondering where your headset was at that point. Yeah, so when Artifight came along, I'd been pretty far down this foot-powered path. And, um, and, you know, the thing with going down this foot-powered path, it... I remember, um, you know, getting past these these boundaries and getting it like just seeing the map as like no longer inhibited on where you could take a machine and where you couldn't, and um, and we had so much excitement out of climbing these lines. We we're like, this is so much more um, emotionally impactful and meaningful to us that. It was wild. I remember the first trip we did in Alaska, and, and there was so much angst. Is it going to work? Da, 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 da. And as soon as we got out there, we were like, this is so cool. This is exactly where we need to be. I can't believe I didn't get here sooner. Um, and then a couple of years into that, Travis asked me to be part of Art of Flight, and we do this. Um, it was two days of heliboarding. And yeah, I think that as someone who lives a really examined life, um, you know, that was a hard thing for me uh, to, to justify, uh, but was in I also went in with an open mind. I'm like, ooh, am I gonna get in here and like, be like, ooh, I missed that. And um, I was happy that I was like, oh, get me back to my split board. Just the, the pace, the money, the noise, the footprint of it all, it's just, I, I'm on a totally, different path with my snowboarding and it would have never worked if I was like I wish I was heliboarding but it's bad for the environment so I'm gonna hike like I'd be surfing <laughs> Yeah, that is a wonderful question. The, that's like the mic drop question, so thank you for that. Um, well, what's exciting about this bill is, as we talked about, it's like the, the government really put out these carrots out there, and people need to grab them, and they need to be grabbed at a community level. And so it's incentivizing um, people to, to grab them. So I just think that it's... Um, and then as we get into this next phase, there's so much work that needs to be done on the local level because we're trying to online a bunch of um, you know, clean energy and then NIMBYism is this massive issue that we're gonna face. Um, and, and so it's just, you know, the work is far from done with this bill. It's going to take a collective effort um, at the local level to do it. And it's, you know, it's not the government coming in and being like, we're building the plan. It's like, if you build this plant um, down the road, we will help incentivize it. Well, I think we're going to wrap this up here in, in a minute, but um, we do have an election coming up. Care to say a few words on that? Yeah, so as we've talked tonight, I hope that I explained our perspective at Protect Our Winners, why we push vote, 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 and, and are so dug in on the wonderful, loving um, world of elections, uh, where we see the best of humanity out there. Uh, but yes, get your friends to vote. Um, there's, we have a Protect Our Winners voter guide. There's a bunch out there. Um, clean air, clean waters on the ballot, a bunch of other stuff's on the ballot. I'm not staying out of that. Um, but I do think that these kids uh, sitting in the deal, you know, in the seat here are going to ask us what the hell we did when this climate emergency was on us. Um, and hopefully we can say we rallied a bunch of our friends 
and we knocked on doors and we helped get climate champions elected uh, this election. So I really hope you can help us um, make this happen. To conclude, uh, you've mentioned this new book of yours, and I thought it might be fitting uh, to have you read a passage that you thought might be uh, particularly relevant to this audience. Yeah, so this book, The Artist for Alpinism, uh, it's been a couple years in the making. And as I mentioned, you know, it's about experiences, mistakes I've made, uh, journal entries, talking about fear and trying to talk myself, you know, through hard things. Um, interviews, like I think in the mountains, there's so many um, informal mentorship is happening all the time. And so uh, I was reluctant to, to write the book and then I'm like, oh, I'm gonna get all these people that I learned all these awesome skills from in the book. So there's probably 30 very targeted interviews to specific people that I think are highly skilled in these certain things. Um, and so in closing, I did, this is, we get the world's first reading of the book and um, I figure we're in a college. Um, and my mother would be really proud because, um, and to be clear, you know, this is my life manifesto. Um, this is not, my book is not about me necessarily telling you what to do, but this is, um, I want to read this section because really for the kids out there, because I'm not of the college age and I'm like, well, what would I want to tell my college kid, uh, you know, my college version of me? So. I thought this would be appropriate. So, um, I believe in karma. Not so much I'm going to win the lottery, be lottery because I helped an old lady with her groceries version. More the idea that if you keep spreading positive positivity, keep opening doors, not closing them, keep giving more than you take, then your path in turn will be smoother and happier. I believe in the power of comp compounding returns that implementing small things into my life, like a simple morning routine done over and over for years on end can lead to major returns. The same holds true for simple diet changes, staying hydrated and reading and writing a little every day, kids. <laughs> Look at your path in life as a series of decisions. I think of those decisions like turns on the mountain. How you weave those decisions together is how you weave through life. Just as making good turns is a never-ending pursuit, the same goes with decisions. By reading, writing, creating art, surrounding myself with inspiring people, I evolve and my decisions evolve. I believe that whom, you surround ourselves, whom we surround ourselves with matters. I look for the jazzed, knowledge-seeking, positive people who push my mind and body to think big and go big. I believe in asking for help. Starting the nonprofit Protect Our Winners as an effort to fight climate change and its adverse effects in the mountains, I had nothing to lose. I knew the only way it would work was if, I, if people rallied around it. Asking strangers for help was scary. What if they said no? POW is the result of scientists, athletes, and industry leaders saying yes. I believe in mentors, both informal and formal. These are people who have more knowledge than me people who have been down the road ahead of me, masters of health, wealth, sport, and science from whom just by hanging out with them, I learn. Some aren't in my daily life. Mostly these aren't snow mentors, but climate and business leaders to whom I reach out with specific questions. I believe in the ode to progression. Not only the phrase, our product development, North Star at Jones is guided by, it is also holds true for life in general. All things can be made better by design or material. Stagnation is not an option. I believe that fear is the most powerful and detrimental emotion in life and the biggest culprit keeping us from our dreams. For me, there are two types of fear. Fear of dying, which is good fear, and fear of failure, which is bad fear. Astonishingly, I have lost more sleep over fear, fear of failure than fear of dying. Understanding the root of your fear and having an intimate relationship with your fear is critical. Fear can keep you alive, but, but it can also keep you from living. I believe you only have so many steps on this planet. What are you going to do with them? 
I choose to use my steps to take me to new places, do new things, and see new landscapes. I believe that a combination of hard work and doing something more than anyone else in the world will get you 95% of the way toward your goals. I believe there's no such thing as overnight success. Someone once told me if you want something really bad, put your head down for 10 years and see where it gets you. I believe you're born into a society that likes to keep everyone on the same path and there's very little encouragement to get off of that path and forge a new one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Well done.